Hey you guys, it's Tomes of Terror time. That's right, we're doing another book review. So anybody who's been around here for any length of time knows that I kind of have something of a soft spot uh, for the very, very small <laughs> subgenre of kind of murder mysteries or crime thrillers that feature real historical characters. So because, you know, some people know this, a longtime friend of the show by the name of Oracle bought me an ebook on Amazon that she knew that I would probably be really into because it sounded like right up my alley. So this book is called A Most Malicious Murder by Melanie Fletcher. Uh, this was first published in 2021, I believe. Uh, and I have to say, Oracle, you, you nailed it. You did really good. Um, this book was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of like a fast paced Victorian era thriller and it has real people and events kind of woven through it, but it's also like an alternate history timeline as well. So this book, I believe is the first novel by Melanie Fletcher, at least under that name. In the end notes uh, of the book, I got the impression that she also writes romance novels, like she's written a bunch of romance novels under a different name, Nicola M. Cameron. And under the name Melanie Fletcher, it looks like she's written a lot of like short stories and novellas and things like that. But this is like the first full length novel, at least as far as I could determine. Now, she said in the end notes that she'd actually been working on the seeds of what would become A Most Malicious Murder ever since 2009. And she said she got the idea when she saw Jeffrey Combs, the awesome Jeffrey Combs, who was one of her favorite actors, starring as Edgar Allan Poe in the one-man play Nevermore, uh, which was actually produced by uh, Stuart Gordon and Dennis Paoli, obviously. So she saw that play, she loved it, and then she started getting all of these ideas about putting Edgar Allan Poe like in kind of a murder mystery type situation. So as I mentioned, this book is an alternate history timeline. So we're positing that Edgar Allan Poe didn't actually die under mysterious circumstances as he did in real life in 1849. In this slightly different universe that we have going on in this book, Poe actually kind of got his shit together, uh, mostly got sober. <laughs> We'll see as, as the book goes on. Uh, ended up marrying his childhood sweetheart, uh, Sarah Elmira Royston, who he was actually engaged to when he died in real life. So this posits he didn't die so that he went on to marry her. And kind of um, launched an even more successful publishing career. And he would eventually found uh, his dream magazine, the one that he'd wanted to found during his lifetime that he never got to, which was called The Stylus. And if that wasn't enough, the story also proposes that Edgar Allan Poe met a young Charles Dodgson, better known to everybody as Lewis Carroll. And the two of them became friends and kind of got to the bottom of the murder mystery, which is at the heart of the novel. Like they teamed up, you know what I mean? Now, the author in the end notes admits that Poe and Carroll probably couldn't have met in real life because Charles Dodgson was only 17 years old when Poe died. And probably if they had met each other, they probably wouldn't have liked each other very much just because their personalities were so different. But she was kind of, I guess she was kind of enchanted by the idea of them kind of collaborating with one another and solving crimes, you know, like Holmes and Watson. So here's the setup of the novel. Edgar Allan Poe, who's kind of like the toast of US and Europe, has been sent by his publisher to the UK for like a lecture tour. So they're kind of hoping that this tour is gonna drum up sales for his own books and collections and stuff, but will also sell subscriptions to his literary magazine that he's just started, which is called The Stylus. So his first stop on this tour is Christchurch, Christchurch College at Oxford. And actually his wife, uh, her first name is Sarah, but she's called Elmira, that's her middle name. Um, so his wife is actually accompanying him on this trip or is supposed to, but when they were on the voyage over the Atlantic, she kind of got sick or like had a little bit of a health setback. So she went to um, spend a week or so like in Bath, England. Um, so kind of leaving Edgar to fend for himself, at least for a week or two. So Edgar seems to be doing fine at first. Um, he checks into a room at this place called the Mitre Inn, and he later gives a very successful, well-attended lecture. Uh, there is kind of a little bit of a kerfuffle at the uh, book signing, which is after the lecture. Um, there's this kind of real arrogant, like snot-nosed 
heir apparent kind of student uh, named Philip Stiles, and he kind of insults him low-key, and Edgar gets a little bit upset about it, as you might Um, But it doesn't really come to blows or anything. It's just kind of like a little bit of a scene. Um, So later on, the embarrassing incident is kind of mostly forgotten. Now, Charles Dodgson, like I said, a.k.a. Lewis Carroll, they never call him that in the book. You're just supposed to know. But, you know, I knew that that's what his real name was. Um, So him and his friends are also students there, obviously. And they also attend the lecture. And none of them really have much patience for Philip Stiles anyway, because, like I said, they think he's, like I said, he's, he's in line for, like, this big inheritance. And he's kind of like an arrogant snot, you know. So after the event, Edgar's kind of minder slash liaison person like from the publishing company whose name is mr tomlinson he persuades poe to come to this um in i think it's what is it called the saddler's arms like this pub to come there to kind of celebrate like how well this stuff did you know come on have a drink poe is gonna be like Nah, it's like, you know, because like I said, he's on the wagon. He's trying to stay sober. He's kind of given up um, drinking altogether as a promise to his wife. He said, no, I promised her I would never drink again. That was the one condition, you know, like that she so she would marry me. Um, But he does admit that he's always kind of tempted, like to go back to the bottle. You know what I mean? Like as an alcoholic would be. Um, And he obviously calls it his imp of the perverse, which is, you know, uh, obviously a reference to his work. So, you know, he, he does kind of, he does kind of feel himself tempted to like have a little tipple now and again. So as you might uh, have guessed, Tomlinson kind of wheedles him into drinking. Ah, oh, one little drink isn't going to hurt you. It'll be fine and stuff like that. Well, you can imagine how that probably goes. Um, Poe cannot just have one drink because, like I said, he's a recovering alcoholic. So he kind of loses control of himself at this pub, gets ragingly drunk, starts shouting abuse at everybody, and kind of eventually gets kicked out of the joint. So Tomlinson takes him back to the Mitre Inn where he's staying. And Poe is so blasted that he just crashes into his room and completely blacks out until well into the following day. Like the next day, he doesn't remember anything that happened. You know what I mean? Now, when he first wakes up in the morning, he freaks the fuck out because he thinks all his shit is gone, like out of his room. Because he wakes up, he's like, where's my stuff? Like, where's my suitcase? Where's all my, you know, where's all my stuff? Um, but then he realizes with relief, as well as a little bit of shame, I guess, that it's like, oh, last night in my inebriated stupor, I stumbled into the wrong room. It was actually an empty hotel room, which was across the hall from his. And he ended up sleeping there instead without being any the wiser. But then, much to his horror, he realizes something else. There's actually a horribly butchered dead woman in this empty hotel room. Um, And she has her stomach completely sliced open. And there's like weird symbols carved into her flesh. So this young woman is named Jane Billings, and she was a chambermaid at the inn. Now, Poe had actually met her the day before because she came up to his room, like, to bring him stuff or whatever, and she was a fan of his, and she, you know, had a book and she wanted him to sign for somebody, you know what I mean, like, as a present. So, you know, Poe didn't know her, know her, but he did meet her, and she seemed really nice, and he's like, so I can't believe that anybody would want to do something this horrible to what seemed like such a sweet, lovely girl that seemed like she never hurt anybody. Um, however, he also realizes that being found in the wrong room with a corpse is, uh, never a good look, especially if you're new in town. So he decides, I'm just, you know what, I'm just gonna go back into my room before anybody finds this body, and I'm just gonna pretend this did not happen. But of course, when the cops arrive, um, they suspect Poe anyway. Um, even though he tells them, oh, I only became aware that there was something wrong or aware that there was a murder when I heard another employee screaming, like when they found the body, which did happen. But, you know, um, he's just saying that he wasn't in there first. That's all. So the cops point out, like I said, they're suspicious of him because, you know, he's a yank um, and he's known as a drunk. He's known as a little bit of a degenerate and all that kind of stuff. Like he's, he has big fans and stuff over there, but some people are still kind of like, eh, you know, so, they, so yeah. So they're like, look, dude, you're an American. You're a stranger here. You just got here. Your room was literally right across from where the body was found. You claim you didn't hear anything. Um, also numerous witnesses could attest to Poe being drunk and super belligerent like the night before. It's like, Hey, maybe you came home and you were pissed off and like you made a pass and she said no. And you were so drunk. You didn't remember. You know what I mean? So they're kind of saying that. 
Um, and they're also like, oh, and by the way, you also got famous writing stories about horrible shit. So obviously you must really be like that. You know what I mean? It's a horror writer. You, you know, you get that all the time. So he basically becomes public enemy number one, the top suspect. Um, and he's told under no circumstances are you to leave Oxford until this murder is solved. Um, you know, we don't care if you have a lecture tour and all of these cities booked, you are staying right here, mister. Now, because obviously Poe wants to leave and continue his tour because money, and also because he genuinely did like Jane, like in the brief time that he met her and kind of feels terrible about what happened to her, he decides that, well, there's no reason that I couldn't be like my fictional detective, uh, Auguste Dupin and try to solve the crime myself, or at least assist the police. They do not want his assistance, but he's like, well, I'm just gonna low key go and assist them anyway. Um, so he had actually copied down the symbols that were carved into the victim's body, but there were two problems with this. Um, one, the symbols look like they were in ancient Greek. Like he recognized some of the symbols, but he doesn't know what they mean because he doesn't read ancient Greek, obviously. Uh, and two, as I mentioned, he didn't want the police to know that he was in the same room with the body and knows about the symbols because the police actually didn't release that information to the public. So if he tells the cops, hey, there were these symbols on the body, it's like, I know what they mean, like, cause he's gonna get them translated. Then they'll be like, well, how'd you know? Because we didn't tell anybody about that. So you were in the body and like, you were in the room with the body and it's like, you were lying and blah, blah. It's gonna make him look even more suspicious. So he happens across Charles Dodgson, uh, AKA Lewis Carroll again, um, who is a bit of a fanboy of his, it seems. And it also happens that Dodgson can read ancient Greek, um, as can many other students at Oxford, because that was kind of a, a thing that they taught people back then. So from this point forward, Poe and Dodgson kind of team up, sort of reluctantly on Poe's part, because he's like, man, I don't really want to be saddled with this kid, you know what I mean? Even though he's a nice kid, but you know. Um, but Dodgson's kind of enthusiastic about it. So they're going to try and find, you know, the horrible person who slaughtered this poor, innocent uh, chambermaid. However, as the story goes on, things start getting a lot more complicated because more people start turning up dead. Um, and the way that they're killed is not dissimilar to like Jack the Ripper. Like there's a lot of, not quite that bad, but there's like a lot of bodily mutilations. Um, and it's clear from messages left on the body and things like that, that the killer has some kind of agenda here and some reason for attacking these particular victims. But, you know, what is it? And why is he taking sort of trophies, like little body parts, like from the bodies, like particular ones, like different ones every time. So yeah, um, as I mentioned, I mean, this is just a great time. It's just a fun, fun book. It's an easy read. It just kind of flew by, but even though it's, it reads really easily, it's still like really good at just um, immediately immersing you like in this Victorian world and with the characters and stuff. And even though I mean, you as the reader know this is an alternate history. I mean, obviously, you know, Poe died in 1849 and it's like, so him being alive is not, you know, um, that that's not really what happened. But there is enough real detail kind of threaded in to make everything in the story seem completely believable, you know? Now, I will say the solution to the mystery I thought was pretty straightforward. I admit I did not guess who the killer was. Um, I knew who it probably wasn't um, just because of the way red herrings are set up and everything like that, but I didn't actually guess who it was, so there was that. But it, but it's a pretty straightforward mystery. It's not super convoluted or anything. Um, but despite that, this does keep you like really really entertained all the way through. It has like really intriguing clues, like all these messages found in the body and like the pieces of the bodies that he took and everything like that. And all the characters were really interesting and like it was really interesting the way they were kind of like figuring stuff out and like butting heads when they were trying to catch this murderer before he killed somebody else, you know? So particularly if you're a fan of kind of Victorian era mysteries, like I said, this, it's not um, quite the same as, cause I know I bring up uh, Drood by Dan Simmons a lot because that's kind of a similar thing. That's Wilkie Collins and Charles Dickens kind of, it was not exactly a murder mystery, but it was similar kind of thing. Um, that was a lot more complex and a lot more convoluted. This one is a lot more, I don't want to say breezy cause that kind of sounds, reductive but it's like it this, this one's a lot more fun and not as densely packed as that one was because i mean that was a chunker for for real this one you know is just an easy 
easy read. Um, you know, yeah, if you know a lot about Edgar Allan Poe and you know a lot about Lewis Carroll, then you'll get a lot more out of this because there's like a lot more details in there, but you don't really have to know that much about them to enjoy the story because it's just a fun story. Like you don't have to know all of this background detail, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so if you like anything like that, Victorian era mysteries, especially with kind of literary characters, then I can't imagine that you wouldn't love this. Um, it's well written. It's very, uh, you know, well paced and it just, it's a page turner. It just keeps you kind of, you know, just keeps you turning the pages until you can figure it all out, you know? And I think it was like a great concept to kind of throw these two real people who never met in real life, like, but throw them together to just kind of like bounce them off each other and see what would happen. Um, and then kind of place them in the middle of what's essentially like a serial killer spree, which, you know, that's pretty fun. And, uh, I kind of feel like, Melanie Fletcher really, I mean, you can tell that she'd been working on this idea for a long time and she really, really wanted to do this idea. Like she, it's the writing, it's almost kind of like exuberant. You can tell like she's having a good time writing it. So hence you have a good time reading it. So yeah, I mean, I think she really made the most of her, this delightful idea that she had and um, definitely knocked it out of the park. I haven't read anything else of hers. Like I don't read romance novels and I kind of feel like that's her main thing, but Man, if she's going to start writing in this genre, then I will definitely like read some more of her stuff because uh, this was pretty great. So as always, thank you very much for watching. And again, thank you very much, Oracle, for sending me the ebook of this. I enjoyed it very, very much, as you probably knew that I would. Uh, but yeah, so please remember, like, share, subscribe, comment, and all of that good stuff. And I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.